All right, so now we need to go into the nerdy part of the session where we dig into how AI for audio and video works and the state of AI for AV. And uh, for that, I have to call uh, my good friend, Jeff Cooper from Saltbox to share with us the latest on how AI for audio and video works. And if you like, Jeff, I can advance the slides for you. Great, yeah, thank you. That works perfectly. We can go We can go ahead and get into it. So actually, uh, sorry, one thing, we are seeing a little, little bit of a, a, a black line on the top and bottom at the moment of the slides. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, let me, thank you for alerting me. Uh, and by the way, Jeff, your volume is a little low. All right, we'll get we'll get the microphone jacked up. How can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Testing, uh, testing. Awesome. Well, while this is getting pulled up, I just want to warn everybody in the class today, this is going to get pretty old pretty fast in the sense that that as we talk about a lot of these artificial intelligence tools, we are fundamentally under the hood using the same technologies across the board. There's very similar methods in the development of code and general purpose machines, as well as the architectures that support them. We talked about things like transformers in the past and deep learning in the past. And so I just want to take a moment to, to at a high level, reinforce some of the things that we've seen when we were talking about large language models like chat GPT, as well as some of these image generation models. There are fundamentally a few basic building blocks here that we are using from a tech perspective to produce these machines. The first one is deep neural networks. So essentially, this is a subset of machine learning techniques, which is a subset of artificial intelligence in the engineering world. And you can essentially think of these deep learning networks as... Uh, general purpose machines. You feed them a bunch of information and you tell them what you want the outputs to be. And they learn over time through a process called training that, that enables these tools to do very specific tasks you chain them to do. We combine these fundamental technologies with a set of training behaviors, usually in two different categories. One is supervised or sometimes unsupervised learning, where we feed the machine information, inputs that we want it to be able to learn to recognize or use, and we train it what we want the output to be. So here's a bunch of pictures of airplanes, or we might do an unsupervised learning version of this. So we talked about with large language models, how a tool like ChatGPT, we actually just fed it fragments of sentences and asked it to predict words just based on all of the content on the internet. And so in that scenario, that's an unsupervised learning. We, we end up with some funky things like it will, it will predict words that we may not have wanted it to predict because it just read them on the internet and it was trained how to do that. And then we also talked about how, just like we do with our children or, or maybe even not our children, our friends, we use reinforcement learning a lot with these machines to tell them when the outputs are good and when the outputs are bad. And what we are doing as a society with things like ChatGPT is we are in mass training these machines with something called reinforcement learning to make those outputs even better. And so, so fundamentally, these are the building blocks. And this is where a lot of the limitations come from. These deep learning neural networks really just do what they're trained to do. And sometimes they do accidental things. We talked about concepts like emergence, where they might do things we didn't specifically think we were training them to do. Then the other processes of supervised and unsupervised learnings is part of what creates some of the deficiencies in these models where we might see outputs we didn't expect or outputs that don't comply with our view of ethics or, or, or non-diverse outputs, depending on the training data. And then reinforcement learning is the way that we as society has been able to overcome some of those limitations of this technology and make it better. We can go to the next slide. So guess what? Audio and video, it all works the same way. So fundamentally, we're using these deep neural networks in a lot of different applications, and we're training them to do very specific tasks. So just because I'm trying to simplify this, though, does not mean it's simple. Under the hood, these types of tools that are helping us do audio generation, like mirroring my voice or Drake's voice, or doing video generation are very complex. Just because you're using a neural network does not mean that you might have a different type of neural network. Like you'll hear people deep in the industry talk about GANs or adversarial networks or diffusion models or autoencoders. There's all different types of these technologies. And fundamentally the challenge from an engineering perspective is there's a push and pull between a few different things. One, producing high quality work. If you want a video to be incredibly well rendered, that's going to take an extremely long time and a lot of computational power. And then there's speed. You can do things like produce a video, but if it takes you 10 years to render that video, your business is probably you know, moved on and it's not helpful anymore. 
And then there's also a concept of diversity. This is not only as it relates to sort of cultural diversity, but also from an engineering perspective, if we want an image of a dog and we want it to be able to produce lots of different colors of dogs, lots of different breeds of dogs, then we have another factor here that requires us to manage and build things that are gonna pull against how fast the machine works and how high quality of the output is. So an example of that is you might have a machine that's very fastly creating images and it's doing it with really great diversity, but then you might get an eyeball on three parts of the dog's head. It's a lower quality sample when it comes out. And so really these are very complex machines, but fundamentally what I wanna communicate is that really these deep neural networks are the secret to our success here from a technology standpoint, but that's also where the limitations come in because the machines just output what we train it to do based off our training inputs. Jeff, before we move on, I wanted to ask you a question. So it was in the news in the past week that Google engineers uh, published a research paper saying that there was some evidence that uh, these networks, that these um, algorithms have some kind of level of consciousness. And um, this was so controversial. Um, basically, they were laughed at. Uh, I don't know if you remember, we talked about this, but a year ago, a, a Google engineer was fired. You know, I'm starting to wonder, and this is, I'm a total layman, but there is this thing we talked about a few weeks ago called, called mirror neurons. And mirror neurons basically uh, empathize with other human beings by mimicking them. So for instance, um, you know, if Jeff right now uh, touches his nose and I touch my nose, um, or, you know, we mirror each other, and there's a lot of that kind of mirroring that's used in connecting with people, imitating each other, and, and it literally fires neurons in our brain. And I wonder, you know, the, the big idea is that um, these things learn through imitation. Um, but that's, I think, how my son learns language. Yeah. And, and there's this idea that there's this, like, Descartesian idea of, like, the soul that like floats atop all this, that's consciousness, that's not the same as the mechanical copying of stuff. And this has been like a debate since, you know, in my philosophy yeah. classes, like one of the classic debates, like, is there a soul or is it all just mechanics? Yeah. Um, and I and I'm starting to now wonder, and I wonder if you're, uh, you know, feeling me on this, maybe there is no there there when it comes to consciousness. Maybe it's all just the notes. And then we attribute the melody that is actually just a creation, an invention, and that, yes, indeed, these folks, these uh, AI models can become conscious. Yeah, yeah, I think this this to me is, is something I could talk to you about for for eight hours. and it does get <laughs> philosophical. but I do think I do think we have to have respect for some of these things. so so the human brain has around ninety three billion neurons in it. That's a lot of calculation power. And your neurons work very similar to how activation functions and, and these deep neural networks work from a technical perspective. GPT-4 has 100 trillion net neurons in the network. So what that means is GPT-4 actually has 10,000 times the computational capability that your human brain does. And so, uh, you know, as humans, I think we are pretty egocentric about how you can't replicate what you're doing. But to your point, we learned, your brain is a neural network and you learned through reinforcement learning and through training. And that, and you develop as a human similar characteristics to a neural network in the sense that you have things like unconscious bias where you were trained with, with bad data deep in that neural network and you're reproducing in the world and you don't even know about it. And even when I talk to you guys right now, I think I'm coming up with these original ideas, but we know a lot of times that that my ideas are a product of the, of the information I read, the TV shows I watch, the things I'm hearing, the people I hang out with. And so I do think there's there's a big question here of, of what is consciousness and how close do these models actually get to it? And do we have human, as humans even have the tools and ability to understand them? And I think where I've landed is, is instead of asking the philosophical question, I have, I have grown to have a, a, a deep level of respect for 100 trillion dimensional calculations. Like we as humans cannot even conceive of what these machines are doing. And I think that means we've got to be very careful with our presumptions of what they're capable of. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to put a, a close to this kind of beer, you know, uh, sitting around a beers conversation. But I, I just wanted to make one last point, which is, you know, we think of life, you know, the fact that we're alive is this kind of miraculous, perhaps even God given thing. But what they found, uh, you know, is if they put a bunch of 
kind of chemicals in a petri dish and electrify it, life happens. Um, and it, it kind of occurs to me that there might be something here uh, similar with intelligence, that if you just like put all the ingredients in and mimic the conditions uh, in the co correct way, we might actually see an emergent property be consciousness, just like we saw when we put a bunch of carbon and oxygen and hydrogen and, and a jolt of electricity, we saw life emerge. Mm -hmm. um, and that a lot of the most precious ideas we have about what makes us fundamentally human, uh, I think are gonna be tested in, in a really interesting way over the course uh, of the next couple of days, <laughs> next couple of years for sure. Uh, and we're entering into this just tremendous moment.